school. You're good. Okay. I can do this. I can do this. That work? Is that good? Mm -hmm. I think so. It looks like it's working. <laughs> so okay. I'll introduce myself. I live in Colorado. Um, I'm a practitioner and a, a wound ostomy condensed nurse. Um, I do, I work with ABC Medical, um, which is a DME company. We have wound care supplies, ostomy supplies, urology supplies. I'm kind of like their clinical advisor. So if they have clinical questions or their customers are struggling with their products or struggling with just any number of things, I'm, I'm a clinical resource for that. So I, I do that, but I also do wound care. Um, I, I have a lot of rehabs um, in the next town over that I am their wound care provider. So, you know, a lot of the stuff you guys are probably familiar with, like debridement and, and support surfaces and nutrition and, and skin grafting, you know, all kinds of things that we do for wound care. I do that as well. Um, I've worked with spinal cord injury individuals for a long time. That's actually how I got started in my whole nursing career. As soon as I graduated, as soon as I graduated nursing school, um, I couldn't really, it was hard to find a job. And the one job that was available was, was in-home nursing care for individuals with spinal cord injury. And I learned so much from that job and I absolutely loved it because people that had been you know, in wheelchairs for a long time taught me a whole lot of things about what they were doing day to day to succeed. And I was like, this is so cool and I can pass this on to the next person. And, and what I found is that the individuals who were, who were living with spinal cord injury often knew more about all these amazing tips and tricks and prevention and things than what I felt like the medical professionals knew about. <laughs> and so I don't know, I, I really learned a lot from that and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I've always enjoyed working with folks with spinal cord injury because I have noticed that a lot of times if they just go to a primary care physician or if they just go to a clinic or, or the ER, they don't always get appropriate care for their particular condition. And so prevention of, of pressure injuries is something I'm really passionate about because I feel like, you know, things happen. People get older, people, like you said, people go traveling and maybe they don't have access to their, their same routine or their, their same support surfaces. People make mistakes. You know, it's, it's hard to keep track of everything and pressure injuries can happen where you get really sick and you go to the hospital, they can happen. But by and large, if you have the right tools and you have the right support in place, um, they're pretty preventable. And so I really like that. I really like the idea of preventing pressure injuries because it's possible most of the time. Um, and as you know, once they get pretty severe, it's just a whole, it's just a whole mess to try to get them to heal. It's just so much beyond the, you know, the, the risk to your health. It's also the time, the time, the time that you have to spend not being able to do the things you want to do. And I think for a lot of my patients, that's, that's where I run into issues. Um, getting wounds healed is they just don't have the time or the ability to offload something for six months straight. Um, that's so not everybody can do it, you know? So that's why I always look at prevention. My talk is supposed to be about new and exciting wound care products. But I think, as you guys know, that's not really how wound care products work. They're not, <laughs> there, um, there are some really cool products out there to get wounds to heal, but as much as I'm, I want to talk about that stuff, but I would also love to talk about just prevention and, and, and facilitate a discussion on things that we know about how to mm -hmm. how to prevent pressure injuries, things we've learned, things that I've learned. So I have a presentation, but I feel like you guys are going to know a lot of this information already about pressure injuries. So I don't want to bore you. Um, and I'd also, I'm completely open to any questions or anything you guys would like to talk about. So feel free to interrupt me or just ask me a question. I'm gonna, I will pull up my slideshow though. If any um, of you do end up having questions, you can probably just put them in the chat. I'll be manning it, so. And then okay, I yeah. And, um, and I don't know, you know, some of you guys may have experienced pressure injury. The reason why I say pressure injury, you know, we hear a lot of terms with bed sore, decubitus ulcer, um, pressure ulcer. The national, the organization in charge of everything pressure injury officially changed the name to pressure injury instead of pressure ulcer. So that's why I use that terminology, um, but it's all the same thing. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm sharing my screen. Let me try to do that really quick. Ooh, how do I share my screen? Oh, there we go, on Zoom. All right. Uh -huh. Can you guys see my screen? Oh. Yes. Yes, okay. Um, Oh, 
Sorry, it's like blocking. Um, sorry, one second. Um, is this block? Yes, that's it. Did you do that? Did you make that go up? Yeah. Oh no. Okay. Oh, oh god, I made. It. I brought it back. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, from the beginning. Okay, and this is just something I put together. I'm not gonna. Uh, I feel like unless I could, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you guys are pretty knowledgeable about what a pressure injury is. Um, and so we'll. Well, some of us, I will, the thing is, um, there are, um, Natalie's pretty newly injured, um, oh. not to call y'all, but yeah. And because it's being recorded for other people to watch, I'm okay. sure there are gonna be other people who might be a, a little newer than we are that are going to watch this. So it's always helpful to at least review the basics. That sounds good. Okay. I just thought I wanted to make the best use of your time and that's good. So let's talk about all of it then. Um, so this is going to be pressure injury prevention for people with spinal cord injury. Um, spinal cord injury increases the risk of skin wounds from pressure. And these are called pressure injuries. And like I said, decubitus ulcers, pressure ulcers, bed sores, these are all the same thing. Um, you know, these, these wounds can be really serious, but there's also a lot of things that, that can be done to greatly reduce the risk or catch them early and, and not let them to progress to the point where it's, where it's serious, super serious. So that's what I wanna focus on. Um, like I said, pressure injury is just a medical term for a bed sore. Um, what happens is that, <clears throat> you know, pressure cuts off blood flow to the skin and underlying tissues. Um, it's often caused by the weight of your body pushing a bony part of your body against a hard surface or a firmer surface. If the pressure isn't relieved within a few hours, the skin and the tissues will die and that leads to a wound. And now that, that few hours time mark is not like a hard and fast rule for everybody. The tolerance that people have to pressure is an individual thing. And so there's a lot of factors at play there. So I don't want you to think that like, well, I have, it's, it's two hours. You know, a lot of times we were taught like, well, every two hours, you know, you know, we have to turn a patient in nursing school, they teach it, you know, every two hours you turn a patient. It's really not that simple. You have to look at the patient. Some people can have a much higher tolerance to time. And some people, especially if they have other things going on, like they're not doing well, they're not, they have nutrition issues, they have hydration issues, or they're sick, they have a fever, you know, something like that. They'll have a much smaller window of, of when those tissues start to die from pressure. So it's, it's not the same for everybody. Um, you know, there's, there's stages of pressure injuries. Um, you know, there's all these different stages, but essentially a, a stage one just means the skin is red and, and it's discolored, but it's not always red. And I think that's important to notice because people have different colors of skin and that's something in the medical manuals that's often missing. We, we look at like very light colored, white, white, pink skin. And we talk about what the beginning signs of pressure injury look like in those people, but not everybody has that color of skin and not everybody's going to have a pinkness to it. And so I think that's worth talking about is depending on what color your skin is, a stage one pressure injury, which is the mildest form of pressure injury and kind of like a warning, like, hey, something's going on. We need to reevaluate the situation. It's not always gonna be pink or red. It's really a better way to talk about it by saying it's a change in the skin. It's a discoloration. So it might be a little bit darker. If you have darker skin, it might be a little bit more pinkish if you have lighter skin. Um, your skin tone is really gonna influence it. But the, the main thing to think about is that it's a change in the color of skin that isn't fading. Cause you know, all of us get little red marks on our skin, like, you know, the waistband of your pants or something like that. But when you take off your pants, it fades. That stage one pressure injury is not going to fade. It's a discoloration that's sticking around. And you can even take your finger and, and push, push into it. Um, but when you push into it, it won't, it won't blanch, meaning that you can't, you can't make the color lighter by pushing into it. It stays discolored. That's a stage one. And I think it's really important to recognize the stage one, because like I said, the stage one pressure injury is it's time to do something. Something's going on here. There's too much pressure. And this, this area is at risk for breaking down further. 
A stage two just means that the, the top layer of skin is gone. It kind of looks like an abrasion. Um, so it's open now, but it's real shallow. It's real superficial. A stage three is, is through the layer of skin. It has more like that traditional ulcer look. So the skin is gone and you sort of have a little bit of a crater there um, because the skin is, has been completely damaged and now you're into the tissues below. A stage four is a deep wound. It goes all the way, it goes all the way to the bone or the muscle or the tendon or whatever's underneath there. There's some other terms you might hear. Um, unstageable. Unstageable usually is just, we don't really know what it is yet because there's some dead tissue in the wound. Like think like a scab. Like if you have a scab over a wound, technically that's unstageable because you don't know how deep it is underneath that scab. And that's what unstageable means. It means there's, there's something obscuring the wound beds. We don't know if it's a stage two or a stage three or a stage four. Typically it's gonna be a three or a four if there's enough dead tissue in the wound bed to hide how deep it is. And then a deep tissue injury, um, it looks more like a bruise. It looks more like a bruise. So it's, it's kind of like a stage one where there's no open wound, but it's usually darker. Um, and so there's a lot of different staging, you know, but, and, and, and the thing is, depending on what stage of pressure injury you have, that's really gonna determine what kind of products we're using um, to try to get that wound to heal. But I'll tell you what, that there's really two things that are the most important in terms of wound healing um, for pressure injuries. Products are important. Don't get me wrong. You need the right kind of products. But what you need more than anything else is to relieve the pressure and have adequate nutrition to, to facilitate tissue healing. To, you know, because you got to grow meat. <laughs> so you got to have the right materials in your system to grow new tissue. So how does spinal cord injury increase the risk? Um, the big one is that loss of protective sensation. So you don't really think about it, but if you do not have a spinal cord injury and you're sitting or you're sleeping at night, your body is, is giving your brain feedback through the spinal cord that like, oh, wow, there's a little bit of reduced blood flow on my left butt cheek. I'm going to switch positions a little bit. And you don't even think about it. You just do it. And the same with sleeping. Your, your body and your nerves send these signals to make these tiny little switches in position all the time. And, and you're not thinking about it, it's not automatic. It's not something you're, I mean, it is automatic. It's not something you're doing. Um, you know, sometimes we switch positions because we're thinking about it, but a lot of times your body just does it. When you have that spinal cord injury, that message isn't getting through. So that, that tissue ischemia, which just means, hey, we're running out of blood down here. Um, it, it's sending that signal, hey, this is, you know, this is the problem. We need some more blood flow down here, but it's not getting to the brain and those tiny changes in position aren't occurring. And so that's one way that it increases risk. Decreased mobility, um, it's harder to reposition yourself. And so you do tend to spend longer periods of time in one position. Sweating, more or less, um, it just kind of depends. If you have higher level injuries, sometimes you can have autonomic dysreflexia and that can change how your body sweats. And so if you sweat more in some areas, the skin can get kind of wet and that can make it weaker. Or if you sweat less, it can be tend, it can tend to get real dry and that can also make it weaker. Um, tissue swelling from immobility, when you're not changing position a lot, sometimes um, tissues can swell and that can weaken the skin. Um, batter, bladder or bowel incontinence. Now this isn't true for everybody, but it can, it can be a thing that happens and that can, just the moisture from that can cause issues with skin weakening. And then low blood pressure. And again, this isn't everybody, but some folks, depending on their level of injury, will have a much lower um, blood pressure than they did before. And this just makes that, 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 um, that blood flow issue more pronounced. So for example, if you're sitting on your butt cheek and you've pushed all the blood out of it, and you also have low blood pressure on top of that, it's harder for that blood to get back in there. And so having low blood pressure, chronically low blood pressure, just means that you're more, you, you have a lower tolerance to pressure. It will break down more quickly. Um, recognizing pressure injury. This is the most important thing, I think, because usually if, if, if action is taken initially, these things don't have to be a big deal. Um, sometimes they, you know, there, there's things that happen, but generally if we're, if we're good about recognizing it, we can prevent it or stop it from getting really severe. So we want to recognize it in the early stages. Recognize a stage one, you know, get, get familiar with your skin and what discoloration looks like on you that doesn't fade. Um, when you recognize a stage one, 
and it's still there the next morning after you've been off of it, that's kind of a sign like, okay, I need to reevaluate what's happening here. You know, is it my cushion? Is it, is it, what, what's, what's going on that's increasing the pressure here? And you may not, it's sometimes it's really hard to figure it out, um, but it's worth looking into. So as we know that, like I talked about with stage one, these pressure injuries, they look like bruises or red areas um, that don't fade away within an hour of relieving the pressure. It's, it's the red flag letting you know, hey, this, this hurt me, but it's not too bad yet. Um, in later stages, pressure injuries will open up and look like wounds. Um, sometimes the depth of the wound can be obscured by dead tissue. Um, that's when we're dealing with those unstageable wounds that are usually pretty deep once we clean out all that dead tissue. Where do they occur? So where do you want to look? Well, anywhere that you're putting pressure on that's bony or anywhere that you have a medical device pushing down on your body. Um, that's where you're going to get it. This, I like this little chart because this kind of tells you the, the, the most frequent locations that people get them. So in all the reported pressure injuries in the U.S., uh, where do people get them the most? Well, they get them on their ischium, which are those sitz bones, and they get them on the sacrum, which is right here. So these are our big areas right here. Um, people also will get them on their hips, usually because they're laying on the side. What I see a lot of, unfortunately, is, you know, somebody will get a pressure injury back here, you know, on their ischium or their sacrum, and then they'll spend a lot of time on their sides trying to get this to heal, and they'll get another one on the side here, on the trochanter, on the hip. Um, the heel is also really prevalent. Um, heels, heels break down pretty, there's a lot of meat there, you know, and it's also the furthest away from your heart. So there's not terrific circulation a lot of times to the heel either. So the heels will break down really fast if they're left just sitting somewhere. Um, so these are the, you know, these are the places to look, but there's other areas too. You know, if you have shoulder blades that kind of stick out a little bit, if you have elbows that you don't feel fully or, and you have trouble repositioning your upper extremities, all these are areas that you can get pressure injuries. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, the bone on the outside of your feet, um, like yes. in between your heel and your toes, what is that called? So the bone yeah. on the outside of your feet, like, is, are you talking about like the edge of the foot? Yeah. Like the outer edge of the foot? I don't know what the, there's a couple of bones in there and I don't know what, the, <laughs> I don't know the names of them, but I know where you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I have like a stage one there, I, I think, um, cause my foot okay. is like turning outwards a little bit, mm -hmm. you know? So, and, and I had a brace and it was like starting, I'm getting a new brace. It's starting to like push against it. Um, yeah. So I was just wondering if that was like a common place or what it was called. It is. Um, especially on folks with spinal cord injury. I'll tell you what, like on the, on the, um, here's where I see it a lot on the feet with, so this isn't a great picture of a foot, but um, yeah, let me see. I'll show you a picture. Um, picture of a foot. <laughs> um, so if we, if we, so what I see a lot of times on my patients with spinal cord injury is they will get them here, like right here. I don't know if you can see this picture, Yeah. Um, yeah. but right here, because what's happening is they're getting a little bit of, of, of contracture in their, in their tendons of the lower leg. And it tends to kind of curl the feet inwards. Yeah. And then, so by putting the feet flat, you know, on the, on the wheelchair foot rests, suddenly it's, it's not really sitting flat, it's sitting like this, and people will start to get pressure injuries right here. I have a patient right now that I'm, that I'm working with who, and he's got a pressure injury right here, and he can't get in his wheelchair right now without putting pressure on it because he needs that, he's quadriplegic and he really uses the, um, like he needs those foot rests to kind of brace his legs against pretty firmly so he can maintain his balance in his um, manual chair. And so he has to have pressure on the bottoms of his feet, but with this contracture, it's turning. And so what we're actually doing is I'm, I'm, I've referred him to a podiatrist who's gonna do a surgery on his tendon to relax that tendon so it's not curled over so much. That's a possibility um, and, and podiatrists do it. I don't remember the exact name of the, the surgery, but it's, it's like a tendon, it's like a tendon lengthening procedure essentially where those tendons have gotten so tight from the contracture that they curl the feet in and they, they cut the tendon. And so it relaxes it and lets the feet sit flat again. And so that's, that's really the only way that we're ever going to get the wound to, to stop coming back on him, unless he's just not going to get in his wheelchair. And that's not an option. Um, oh, I yeah. I don't know. If that was a, I'm sorry. What was that? 
I was just wondering if that's what's happening to my foot and none of my doctors just get, know about it. <laughs> Podiatrists are really good for things with things like that. Um, you just have to be clear. Like sometimes I've found that, and this is just generally speaking, that when you go to the podiatrist, they see the wound, they're like, cool, we'll debride the wound and we'll do some wound care to it. But you have to make it really clear, like, hey, the issue, I mean, please debride the wound and heal it. But the issue is it keeps coming back because my foot's turning in. Um, and so orthopodiatrists might be the best one for that. But um, they they will, th there's definitely a thing they can do to the tendon to make it so your foot goes flat again. Um, and there's probably different techniques, but yeah, it's worth looking into. And you know, you want to try to prevent those contract, but those contractures happen over time. I mean, you can do like range of motion stuff um, regularly to kind of try to keep those tendons supple and, and not shortening from lack of use. But over time, it just, it just kind of happens because you're not standing on the feet. But braces, I know they make braces for people too. So a new brace might be, you know, that you said you had a new brace coming and that might be helpful too. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Susan raised her hand. Susan, you got a question? Sure. Did I, did I need to do anything for that? Are you talking about foot drop? Foot drop is one is one thing, but there's also an um it is it is like a, a similar it, it is foot drop. Foot drop is just the, you know, as you know, it's the it's the heels kind of pulling up but there's another motion of contraction that happens as well, where they start to kind of curl inwards. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same procedure that they would use to fix foot drop where they're just, they're, they're just, they're, they're making that tendon not so tight. So it's not pulling that foot in that weird position where it's putting pressure on a side of it that, that can't handle it. I thought foot drop, that's a matter of contraction. I thought it was a matter of like th that, that it was like loose, the tendon. It's tight, actually. So foot drop. Um, so what happens with foot drop? Foot drop is usually from people that are not put any pressure, like they're not wearing, they're in bed a lot. So if you look at foot drop, so foot drop. Um, so there's a good picture. Um, yeah, that's a good picture. So foot drop right here, it's this tendon back here um, is, is uh, shortening, it's contracting. And so it's, the, and it's, it's not really like once you have foot drop, you can't make that tendon, it, it's permanent, you know, it stays contracted. And so the, that's, that's what it is. This tendon, if you think about it, when your foot's flat, that tendon's fully stretched out, right? Like this. And so if you're standing on your feet, you're always stretching that tendon out. If you sit in bed or you're not putting any, any pressure on the bottom of your foot, that tendon just starts to shorten up because it's not being pushed this way. And so and then- it, Stuck Stay and bent back up. It what? And then like it gets stuck straight and it can't get bent back up properly. It it gets stuck. Yeah, it, it atrophies. Um, so that tendon, you know, tendons are kind of like rubber bands. You know, they need to be stretched, <laughs> stretched out to maintain that range of motion, that flexibility. And so when that tendon is not being stretched out by not putting the foot flat like this, it just kind of contracts up. And it doesn't have that it, that range of motion on it gets shorter and shorter and shorter until you get stuck with this foot, like in this position, because that tendon is so contracted up. Okay, because my foot, my ankle pretty much, if I'm laying down, it's pretty much straight, but it can still bend to get into shoes and things like that. Well, because you're still getting into shoes and things. That's what it is. Um, oh, okay. because, yeah, so you're, this is like, you primarily see foot drop, for example, if you've ever you know, it can happen like if somebody's in a coma for three months in the ICU and nobody's moving their feet around, they can come out of the hospital with foot drop because they have not put on shoes or flattened the feet at all for three months. Okay. Um, so it can happen. I mean, it can happen pretty quickly, but you're getting, you know, you're in bed and then you're getting in a wheelchair and then you're putting, you're putting shoes on your feet, right? Yeah. So you're, you're moving it. You're keeping that tendon supple. It's, it's, it's when there's no movement of that tendon and no weight bearing of that foot that it really happens. Okay. But sometimes it curls in. Um, and I guess, you know, it is a form of foot drop, but when it starts to curl in is when people start putting pressure along that, that side of the foot. Um, but again, if you have foot drop or if you have that, cur that kind of inward turning of the feet where you notice like, wow, I'm putting a lot of pressure on the sides of my feet. 
and I'm starting to get wounds, um, talk to a podiatrist or orthopodiatrist because sometimes there's shoe inserts that they can put in your shoes that offload the edges of the feet. Um, and sometimes if it, you know, if that doesn't cut it or braces, they can, they can use. And if braces, um, and braces will help it a lot of times from getting worse because they're keeping it in the right position. But if, if neither of those things work, there is a surgical procedure they can do to relax that tendon. So it's not so stiff and held in that position. Mm, okay. Um, yeah. let me pass this point because you brought up something that like is kind of an issue for me, but I definitely sure. have a wound that um, likes to open from time to time. Um, for the most part, I catch it early and it hasn't become too serious of a thing. Good. Um, but for that reason, I sleep on my hips. And because I sit on my butt all day long, I sleep on my hips. Um, and so I have pain, like I'll, 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 I'll turn like every like four hours or so. Um, and if I happen to forget to turn, the next day, whatever side I was laying on hurts immensely. And so then the next night I lay on that side for a while. And then the next day that side hurts. And wow. I haven't had any tears. I haven't had any sores on my hips, but they hurt all the time right. laying on them. And so, and I can't really lay on my belly. I'm kind of operated um, in my bladder. Um, and so what would be the resolution for somebody like me who doesn't want a sacral wound to open up and is having a lot of pain in the hips yeah, it's tough. Um, so you're you're you have a sacral wound. Yeah. And okay. And so it, is it kind of high, high up on the? No. I mean, it sounds like a weird question. Is it higher or is it like right right above like right, right above, under my tailbone, like right, right under your tailbone, it's like real close down low. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So the ones that are like lower, um, generally speaking. The ones that are like, so if it's higher, the reason why I ask is so if it's higher up, like if it's higher up on kind of like above the, above the tailbone area, those, those are often from laying down, you know, flat because you're putting pressure right there. But if it's right on your tailbone, those are a lot of like, if it's right on the tailbone or it's right on those two ischial tuberosities, those sit bones, that a lot of times that's more from, from sitting you know? Um, so it's just something to think about. So the real pressure is probably more so from sitting than laying down. But to answer your question, I have some questions for you. <laughs> um, so you're, you're kind of going, so you're going from side to side and that's, that's uncomfortable. Um, it's probably hard to get a good night's sleep. What, what kind of, do you have a, what kind of mattress and what kind of wheelchair cushion are you using? Yeah, well, I actually switched from an air mattress since I thought that might have been part of the problem because it always felt very hard for me. And I got um, a purple mattress. Okay. Um, which I've, I found to be pretty, pretty comfortable. I, 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 the pain feels a little less than in the air mattress. And I have a Rojo cushion, but I don't think that I've ever properly like distributed the air in the cells as I should. And sometimes I wonder, like I try to not like overfill it, but I don't like specifically like kind of like how Lauren was saying, she like bottoms out one area where her wound is. Like I don't bottom out like where my my issue on it is or uh, is the station, right? Yeah. I don't like, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong with the Rojo, but I use a Rojo cushion on a purple mattress. Okay. Well, do you, have you ever been to a seating clinic? Is that an option in your area? I've been to a wheelchair clinic. Or a wheelchair clinic where they, I don't know where you live and what's available, but a lot of times um, if there's a wheelchair clinic, they'll have like a seating specialist and they'll have an ability to even pressure map your butt where you're sitting and they can look and see like, okay, so the way your cushion and the way, even, even the way your wheelchair is aligned um, can make you put pressure more in certain areas. And so the wheelchair clinic, you might want to call them and just see like, hey, you know, do you have a seating specialist who can kind of look and see if everything is, is optimal? Is my cushion inflated to an optimal level? Is my wheelchair seat at an optimal angle? Is everything optimal to kind of really spread out pressure and not put it in one place? Um, because they can, I don't know if your wheelchair clinic can do that, but wheelchair clinics can do that. Um, in terms of inflating it, what I was always taught by Rojo um, and, and what I would use is like, and you know, you would have to probably have someone, I don't know, you might have to have someone help you or you might be able to, to do it, but 
you know, when you stick, here's how I check cushions is, is if somebody's sitting in them, I want to stick my hand under there and I don't want to feel the point of any bony part, like touching my hand. I want to have a little bit of wiggle room here. Does that make sense? About an inch back and forth, not an inch up and an inch down, but an inch total. So that way I know that those bony prominences are kind of floating in that cushion as opposed to like bottoming out. Um, but it sounds like you're not bottoming out. How long have you had the wound? Oh God. Uh, uh, at, oof, at least, uh, at least uh, like nine years, like eight, eight, nine years. Okay. It isn't open now? No. No, okay, cool, cool. No. Uh, I was gonna say sometimes wounds too, they'll stall out. Um, well, Meaning, like, it's only ever reopens like when I like travel, I'll do something. If I get like, if I, yeah, I need to, I need recommendations for a cushion for, for airlines too, because like, I can't put the roll hole in there. I'm six feet tall. I put okay. the roll hole in there and I'm like at mid back. So I'd have nowhere, like my head is just like, the roll is very uncomfortable to try and put on an airline seat. And so it's opened when I've been on an airline seat or like if I've slept like on a regular bed traveling or had to do something weird. Those are the only times when it'll reopen okay. and it's just super quick. But um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it's not open now. Um, in terms of sleeping on your on your hips and it's hurting. Um, I mean, that's how, I mean, anything that's hurting makes me feel like like man, we should figure out something different, <laughs> but it's hard. Like what I'm thinking, like, I know you said you had an air bed and you switched it out for a purple um, mattress. I don't really have a lot of experience with the purple mattresses, uh, mm -hmm. but they sound good in theory. Um, are you, are you using like pillows and things like that to really position yourself in a way where you're not putting a ton of pressure right on the hip? I mean, I use the pillows just to, to put behind like my, my kind of my bottom, because that's the thing I have like low back pain so a lot mm. of times just the sometimes I'll try and lay in the bed flat and I'll put a bunch of pillows under my legs like really high up so my knees are kind of up yeah but that feels like the pain in my lower back is getting a lot of pressure yeah um yeah that's I mean in terms of skin I think you're doing everything right you know, because you, you've had this thing that comes and goes, you know exactly when it happens, you catch it early, you're repositioning yourself in bed, you found a mattress that is pressure reducing that works for you. Um, you have a rojo cushion, it might be good. I think it's good. To, I have just been amazed sometimes by seating clinics and what they discover. They're like, wow, look at this pressure map. It shows that the angle of the wheelchair is just putting a whole lot of pressure right here. And if we fix the angle of, I mean, I'm not saying that's the case for you, but I've seen it happen. I've been like, wow, I, there's no way I could have just looked at that and known that, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that they can be helpful in terms of that. The airline thing is tough. It just sucks that people have to get out of their wheelchairs to fly. Girl, um, started. It's ridiculous. And I, I've heard that they're working on changing that. I've, re I've heard that there's like a prototype or something of, of Delta. Yeah. Have you seen that? I've read that before. So it's just, it's just hype. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm just it's saying. a perpetual prototype. Um, that, that it sucks though. Cause it's not like, well, I don't have to tell you it's, it's not like a, it's, it's a medical device. You need it to, to be in your optimal safe position, you know, but yeah. Um, in terms of, I mean, do your hips look good? Are they, are they yeah. the right color? Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably like a, a, like you said, if you have low back pain and, and joint joint pain it's probably just to do with positioning um okay physical therapist <laughs> that's it for things like that where i'm like you know i'm not sure how to make this pain better um that has to do with positioning um sometimes they can really help because they have they have a good i mean not all of them but some people physical therapists that spend a lot of time working with sei patients are usually pretty knowledgeable about about like pain reduction positions and things like that so you could try there Okay, seating clinic yeah. MPT. Yeah, I mean, those, those, those are the two resources that come to mind. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Yeah, it's okay, okay, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about pressure injury prevention. That's my favorite. Like I like healing ones, but I like it way better than when people just don't get them, way yeah. better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, catching it early, which I mean, you everybody who's spoken so far has been like so impressive to me because everybody just catches it early. You guys are like, you're doing all the detective work that that's what it all it is you're like 
you know, when, when these following things happen, I tend to break down a little bit and then I jump on it and I correct it. And, and that's really, that's the name of the game. That's pressure injury prevention is recognizing patterns in what causes the skin to break down, catching it early and changing, changing behaviors just, you know, so you can get it closed up and you're back, back normal. Um, so that's great. Skin checks are really important. It's really important. Sometimes it's hard to check your own skin. If you have someone who can help you, great, but not everybody does and not everybody wants to. Um, you can use mirrors. I've seen a lot of different ways people do it with mirrors. I found these these images, but you can just set mirror, like these makeup mirrors are kind of nice because you can rotate it and you can kind of turn your body towards it and see what's going on. They sell mirrors with handles, like flexible handles on Amazon. And so you can kind of use that. Just check um, the, the, the areas you want to check are the areas you've been sitting on. You know, so if you, in the morning, you know, you might want to check your sacrum and your heels, because that's probably what's at risk for getting, for getting breakdown over, overnight. When you're up in a wheelchair, when you get out of the wheelchair, you want to check those sitting bones and that tailbone area. Um, and then if there's, you know, there's other, you know, if, if something's going on where you're, you know, you're in a, in a different kind of position for a long time for some reason, you're going to want to check that area. But routinely, it's usually the backside and the heels is what we're going to look for. If you have somebody that helps you, um, teach them. Teach them to look for this stuff because they may not know. They may not know it's important to check these areas and they may not know what, what skin discoloration looks like or means. Um, so that's something that's definitely worth teaching who, if, if you have somebody that helps you. Um, this is the, this is a grainy picture. I'm sorry for that, but I just want, these are the things that I look for. This is what your caregivers or yourself should be looking for. If you're, if you're checking your skin, um, this is it. So you want to look at something like this. This is a stage one pressure injury. It's discoloration. It's not fading. Like you've been off of it for two hours and it's still there. This is what you want to kind of look at. This is the, the sign that maybe, maybe you got to be the detective, figure out what's going on, what went different, what can we change to reduce pressure on this area. And the great thing about stage ones is they, they get better. Like when you take the pressure off of them, it's going to be okay. They're, they're going to heal for the most part. Skin tolerance to pressure, I think, is something that um, is an art. <laughs> and I think the, um, really the artist behind it is going to be the individual, you, you guys. Um, you have to kind of build skin tolerance over time and all this means is like how much pressure can my skin take before it starts to get get upset with it um everybody's different age you know age age makes a difference like our skin loses strength as we age it's just a fact of it you know we get wrinkles we get that 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 is your skin losing collagen your skin is less tough as you get older your skin is less tough when you have a fever your skin is less tough if you're if you're malnourished or you're dehydrated um if, if you're depressed, I mean, if you're just not doing well um, in any way, mentally or physically, your skin is just not going to be as resilient. That's how it works. Your skin's an organ, just like anything else. And if you're not, if you're sick in any way, your skin's going to be more fragile. But if you're doing pretty well, um, your skin should have some tolerance to pressure. And if you're newly injured, it's probably going to have less tolerance to pressure because this is all new to it. It hasn't been in a situation where it had to sit for a long time and not move before. So if you're newly injured, we kind of want to build up skin tolerance over time. And, and what that really means is like, okay, let's try repositioning in bed every two hours and let's try repositioning in the wheelchair every 15 minutes or so and, and see how things look. And if we check our skin at the end of the day and everything looks great, maybe we can try to stretch that out a little bit more. Maybe we can try every 30 minutes. Um, maybe we can try, you know, every three hours in bed and we can slowly increase it. And, and when the skin starts to get red, now you don't want to go from like 15 minutes to three hours, you know, in the wheelchair and, and you want to gradually increase it and see how it does. Um, but you'll kind of identify a sweet spot of like, okay, so it seems like my skin is pretty okay without a lot of redness. Um, you know, when I reposition this frequently and, and that works for me. And so that, but it's kind of an individual thing. That's why we, we have these general rules like, oh, everybody should reposition in a wheelchair every 15 to 30 minutes or every two hours when in bed. Those are general rules. They don't really apply to everybody. So you kind of want to feel yourself out and see where you're at. And remember that if things have changed about you, like you're, you're not doing as well, or you're in the hospital or you have a UTI or, you know, if anything has changed with you, this tolerance may change as well because your skin might be a little more fragile. 
Pressure reducing support surfaces improve skin tolerance because they redistribute the pressure better. Um, so that's why we have those wheelchair cushions with you know the air cells, you know, Rojo. That's why um, for some people, low air loss mattresses on the bed and things like that are really helpful because they give you more time. Essentially, you still got to reposition, but they give you a little bit more leeway and maybe a little bit more time before you have to reposition. Um, wrong way. So weight shifts and pressure breaks. This is probably one of the most, I mean, this is really the most important thing um, in a lot of ways to preventing pressure injury. Um, the type of pressure relief maneuver really depends on your level of injury and the type of wheelchair that you have. This is another PT physical therapist thing um, that they are really, I feel like they, they have some good techniques and advice about how to, how to reposition your body. Um, there's some general moves that people can use. Um, for people using manual wheelchairs, at least 15 seconds of pressure relief every 15 minutes or 30 seconds of pressure relief every 30 minutes is like a good rule of thumb. Some people may find that their skin tolerance to pressure is greater than that. They don't have to do it as often, um, but that's a good place to start. For people who use power chairs, um, and again, this depends on the type of power chair you're using, but if you don't really have a lot of arm strength to reposition your, your, your backside very well, you're gonna to wanna to do a longer pressure break um, every 30 minutes to allow those tissues to fully refill with blood. Um, it's also recommended too, like, you know, if you're in a manual wheelchair and you're doing 15 seconds of pressure relief every 15 minutes or 30 seconds every 30 minutes, um, you should still spend some time like out, of, you know, get out of the wheelchair sometimes and let that tissue fully like reperfuse full of blood. Um, physical therapists can help. This is an example and you've maybe been taught these, but, um, you know, these are examples of some maneuvers you can try for manual wheelchairs. So she's doing a push up here. Um, she's pushing, using her arms to push. And again, this you would have to have pretty full arm function for these. Um, you, she's doing a push up where she has lifted her butt off of the wheelchair and she's holding it there. Here's one um, where she's leaning forward. She's probably using her other arm to brace herself so she doesn't fall. And then there's also kind of a side to side where you tilt on one side, and then you tilt on the other, and you would want to hold these for 15 to 30 seconds to kind of let that blood flow return to the area. For manual wheelchairs, there, there's the tilted space maneuver. Um, not all manual wheelchairs, sorry, for um, power chairs. Not all power chairs have this feature. I think it's a great feature to have, and I think everybody should have it if you can't really reposition yourself with your upper body strength. Um, because you have a higher level of injury or maybe you have shoulder injuries or whatever. If it's really hard for you to reposition yourself, um, you know, looking into getting a, a, a power chair that has this feature can be really helpful. And so what you do is you tilt your backrest back and then you put the, you know, put the feet up, tilt in space. So you're tilting back and flattening out and it's putting the pressure on your back here instead of your butt and it lets the blood return. Um, most folks that I've worked with that had this kind of wheelchair and had great skin, they were doing it, um, you know, they were doing it about every hour. Every hour they would tilt back. Um, so, you know, sometimes they would go two hours, but they, they would tilt back and hold it for at least three minutes because it takes a couple of minutes for the blood to fully return to the tissues. So that's what they were doing. Most, most folks that I knew that had great skin and had been in a, a manual or sorry, a power chair for years and years and years. They were doing um, about three minutes of, of full pressure relief with that tilt and space maneuver and um, doing it about every hour or every two hours at the most. Seating clinics, we already talked about it a little bit. Um, they can customize and really adjust things. Like I've had, I've recommended patients go to seating clinics. And one time I went with a patient and I was just blown away by, by like the level of detail <laughs> that they looked into with the pressure and things like that. So um, it's worth looking into, like, if you feel like, wow, you know, everything's pretty good when I'm in bed at night, but I've noticed that I keep having like, you know, my, my left issue just, you know, I have the right cushion on my wheelchair. I've taken pressure breaks, but it just tends to break down when I'm in my wheelchair. It's only on the left or, or whatever, you know, something like that. I, you know, they may not solve your issue, but it's worth starting there. Um, just to see like, is there some adjustment we can make to this wheelchair or some uh, adjustment we can make to this cushion? to make that pressure a little bit more distributed off that area that keeps breaking down. Bed positioning, um, and this is, you know, you're talking about that side-lying position. This is what we, we do for a lot of people to try to, you know, I'm thinking maybe because your spine might not be fully aligned, sometimes, I mean, but you said you're using lots of pillows, but, you know, putting, 
putting it pillows between the knees to try to keep the leg kind of flat, you know, so it's not like dip, dipping down. Um, and then using a pillow behind the back and then a pillow to kind of get the, the foot off the mattress. Um, pillows are great, lots of pillows, because you want to kind of make the body straight and aligned and without too much pressure in just one area. Um, oops. So bed positioning is important at night. Um, you know, having a pressure reducing mattress, I, I think is, is good. Um, if you're not having any issues with your current mattress and you're not having skin problems, okay. But if you start to develop skin problems, looking into a pressure reducing mattress can be helpful. And one thing I will say is there's really two different, like higher level um, beds for, for pressure reduction are often only given to people once they develop a wound. They're honestly really preventative devices too. So if you're feeling like you're prone to developing wounds from laying down, a pressure, a pressure mattress can do a lot. And there's really two features that we have. There's alternating pressure and there's low air loss mattress. And they're very different. And, and clinicians will often just say, oh, it's an air bed, but they're not the same. <laughs> so let me just put it like this. So an alternating pressure mattress, it just kind of inflates and deflates and it, it moves the pressure around a little bit. And it's okay. It's not the worst thing. But the absolute best thing for wound healing and, and for high, high risk individuals who get a lot of wounds from being in bed is going to be the low air loss mattress for sure. Because what that low air loss mattress does is it's kind of like the Rojo where it has all those different cells full of air and it's kind of deflating and moving a little bit and reducing the pressure, but it's also letting air out of the mattress. And for whatever reason, that air, the low air loss, like a little bit of like a slow leak coming out of that air, the air coming out of that mattress cools the skin and it, it keeps the skin drier and it tends to like really reduce the risk of, of wound formation. So that low air loss feature is important. So if you're ever just looking into air beds, you're gonna hear the general phrase air beds and you feel like you're higher at risk or you actually have a wound that needs healing, make sure whoever's ordering you that bed doesn't just get you a mattress with alternating pressure. You deserve the one that has the low air loss feature because that's the real deal, like wound healing skin prevention bed. Um, a lot of them have both features, but you just want to make sure it has that low air loss feature because that's the one that's going to really protect the skin. Amy, can you get something like that as an overlay? There are some overlays. Um, there's most of the overlays that I have seen are just the alternating pressure. And, and that's not bad. Like, I'm not saying that alternating pressure is, is garbage. <laughs> it's not. It does alter, it, it does reduce pressure and it's a good preventative device. Um, they have some, I have seen a low air loss overlay, but I think for the most part, like here, let's look. Um, for the most part, it's actually a mattress, but you can use it. Um, so you're here, getting that see. kind of in like a air pressure overlay over this purple mattress that has the foam that's supposed to. Yeah. I mean, so the mm -hmm. most of the low air loss mattresses are going to look like this. So I guess in theory, you could stick that on top of your bed, but it's really its own thing. You know, it's like its own, its own mattress. The alternating pressure, um, these are all, these are all low air loss mattresses. Um, the alternating. Oh, there was one up there. Was there? Up just a little, right there. You said what, guys? No, no. <laughs> when um, you went down. Two uh, to keep this going. Nope. Oh, look, low air loss mattress overlay. That's an overlay. Okay. Yeah, I was looking at the one right beneath it. I think it might be the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So, the, but you just want to make sure. I would just say if you're, if you can get ins insurance, can be difficult. It depends on what kind of insurance you have. But I'll tell you what I deal with a lot at ABC Medical is dealing with insurance not paying for things and trying to figure out what people are supposed to do. That's like the main part of my job <laughs> sometimes. And I know we don't we don't carry low air loss mattresses, but I still talk about it with people because it's a good, it's a good thing to know about, um, you know, Medicare, um, which, you know, private commercial insurance and Medicaid's are different, but, but it can be hard to get approval for one of these, unless you already have a wound, which is infuriating because they prevent wounds, right? But that's, that's what they do. And so, you know, that's just something to bear in mind. Um, but I can sometimes ask my doctor to write a a prescription for an you got, yeah it, it, the prescription you got to get a prescription for it to get insurance to pay for it period so you can try um it just depends on what your insurance what what your insurance will cover what i have run into sometimes is that if it's just like medicare straight medicare um which you may not have you know but if it's just straight medicare 
they will often not cover these higher level of air vents um, until you already have a wound. And so not that I want anybody to get a wound, but just bear in mind like, hey, I have a wound. Maybe I, this is the time to get that air mattress and you don't even have to use it, but at least you have it. You, you know what I mean? Um, because most of the time, if you don't have a wound, they might cover something. They might get you something like, you know, they might get you a little overlay or something. But if you want a true blue, like low air loss mattress with alternating pressure, um, like a high level support surface, the Medicare criteria is that you have to have a stage three pressure injury on your trunk somewhere oh. um, or two stage twos. Um, oh, somewhere. okay. Yeah. So you did. It's not helpful. It's not, they want you to be hurt, <laughs> unfortunately, before they get you one. So I, I don't want anybody to get one. To, to but if you ever do one. have one, that's the time to do it. Like if you ever yeah. do that, have your doctor write that order. For that I don't want to even think about that time or pretend that time might come, Amy. Okay. So no, is there a place <laughs> where you suggest <laughs> if I could just buy it out of pocket, right? You where can, absolutely. I've seen them on eBay. Like I feel like people sell, and I mean, people have different comfort levels with used stuff but i see used ones i mean you can wipe that thing down you know whatever so i i see used ones that are far more reasonable than a new one that look like they're in pretty good shape because i've looked for people before what are what are we talking about reasonable um well, i mean it's good. we'll email <laughs> let's email about that this is all okay. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> a shopping button. you're gonna be sad um but look like it just depends you know anywhere <laughs> from several hundred dollars to several thousand dollars um honestly it's what i see Okay. okay. Um, but look around, like, you know, there's Facebook groups for people who are like selling, like trading and selling medical equipment and stuff like that. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes that these things come up, like someone had one and they don't need one anymore. And they're like, what do I do with this thing? So I don't know. I, I think you can find used ones that are more reasonable for sure. Okay. Um, Susan has her hand up. Go ahead, Susan. Oh, sure. I know you have to go. Where may I find a recording of this? I'm going to email it. I'm going to email. You get my emails, right? The wow emails. Thank you, dear. Yes. You'll get. You'll know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You too. And I know I'm a little over time. I have time to keep talking if you guys want to hear the rest of it. Um, yeah, of course. Because, I mean, it's going to be online. Like Susan said, you know, people are going to watch. A lot of people had to drop off, but okay. a lot of people are going to yeah. watch later on. So cool. yeah, let's keep going. Then. <laughs> um, this is something that I think it's really important to talk about. And this is a problem in hospitals. I will tell you right now, um, big time, <laughs> is um, positioning a bed. So if you have an adjustable bed, if, you have an, if you're just flat like this all the time, well, the pressure, you can still get pressure injuries for sure. But the pressure is more evenly distributed between your head and your shoulders and, and your hips and your, you know, the sacrum, your calves, all of it. It's all spread out. People who are in bed, let's say you're stuck in the hospital. This is, I always think of this example, and this is why so many people come out of the hospital with pressure injuries, um, is because we have adjustable hospital beds and they're not always pressure relieving. So you have your standard hospital bed that is not really pressure relieving and you can sit the head of the bed up. And what that does is it puts all of the pressure right there on the sacrum. And that's what we see people coming out of the hospital with is mm. pressure injuries of the sacrum. Because what they do is they sit the head of the bed up above 30 degrees, they slowly slide down it, kind of shearing those tissues and weakening them, and then they settle on them and sit there in that position. So it's just something to think about. Now, some people have to sit up to breathe. Like if they have like COPD or something like that, they may not be able to lay flat on their back. That's a whole different story. That's a whole different challenge. But if you are able to lay below 30 degrees, it's a good idea to do that. You don't want to spend all day in this position, especially when you go to the hospital, because you're probably not on a great bed. Um, or, or maybe you are, but either way, you're putting a whole lot of pressure right here on the sacrum. And here's the pressure mapping I was talking about. Like, this is what the pressure looks like on somebody who's laying below 30 degrees of, of head of bed elevation spread out, right? This is what it looks like on somebody with the head of the bed above 30 degrees. And 30 degrees isn't that much. So if that head of the bed is elevated, what I suggest people do, because like you want to see the TV or something, right? Um, or you don't want to be laying flat on your back, staring at the ceiling. Try to use pillows just to elevate your neck. Like stick pillows behind your head and neck. So that part of you is sitting up, but the rest of you is relatively flat still. And it will reduce the pressure a lot. Um, heels, float the heels off the mattress. You know, um, this is a big one. Like if, if, you know, some people are more tolerant than others. You may have your mattress, your heels sitting on the mattress and not have a problem. But the fact of the matter is, especially if you're in bed for a long time, like days, you know, or if you're sick or, or something like that or in the hospital, again, 
if your heels are just sitting on the mattress and they're not move, being moved around, there's no meat there. You know, it's just bone right there. So you'll you'll definitely get a pressure injury over time if those heels are left sitting on the mattress. And so we just want to float them, get them off the mattress. You can stick a pillow under your calves. Or I love these because they're nice. Like some people have muscle spasms of their legs where their feet will kick off of of, mat, of pillows and things like that. These heel, these are soft heel protector boots. You can buy them on Amazon. Um, they have this little hole cut out here. So really, no matter what your leg is doing or where it is, you're not going to be putting pressure on the heel. Um, friction and shear. Friction and shear is important to talk about sliding. So we think about pressure injuries as being from pressure of sitting, and that's only a piece of it. Friction and shear is, is one of the biggest forces other than pressure that makes people's skin break down. And so for, for folks that are transferring in and out of wheelchairs and beds and things like that, they're at increased risk because you're sliding. And also you're sliding when you don't know it. Like when you get in the bed and you sit the head of the bed up, you slide down it. Um, and so that what happens is part of your skin is kind of staying put against that surface. And then the other part, like your body weight is kind of pulling. And so it's sort of separating on a real small scale, those, those different layers of skin. And that, that definitely weakens it and makes it more likely to break down under pressure. So we want to do everything we can to reduce friction and shear. Um, like I said, try to keep the head of the bed below 30 degrees when you can. Um, if you notice you're slowly sliding down in the bed, you know, you might need to lower that head of the bed. Um, sliding boards. So people use sliding boards. I don't know if any of you guys use sliding boards, but to get out of bed or, or into the wheelchair and things like that, sliding boards will really put a lot of friction and shear on your backside. A cheap and easy way to reduce that is by putting a chucks pad on it underneath and, and then sitting on the chucks pad and sliding on that um, because that becomes like a slippery layer between your backside and the board. Another thing is they actually sell these like no friction sliding boards, which are kind of cool. Um, they have different shapes, but you can check them out at BZ Trans. Um, we don't have them at ABC Medical, but, and I don't know, I don't know the insurance coverage on these, but they're pretty cool. They, you sit on it and it just slides right here. So getting in and out of car. I have a question. I don't sure. see, I've seen these and I'm looking at the part where, okay, so if you slide this to one end, I, my body has to still get on to one edge of it, right? Like, right. So I could still skid on that one edge. I understand the not skidding on the entire board across the way to your destination. Yeah. But is there something different about the material of these where the edge of that still can't skid my skin? I think it could. I think it would. I think it still could. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. You okay. know, like you would put this part all the way over and then like stick that underneath, underneath, you know, that, that sticking it underneath there could do a little shear, but if you were able to like lift your body, lift, over. lift a little bit yeah. and then stick it under there and then kind of plop down on it and then slide over and then do the same thing. You know, I think that that would probably minimize it, but I, I do know what you're saying. It's still sticking in there, it's still going to cause a little bit, but it's not going to be as damaging as like sliding with your whole body weight across something. Awesome. Yeah. Because I wonder if like when I see this, because the point is for the disc to go off to one end, you get on that part and then the, the disc moves and your body doesn't, right? But right. I can't, you know, if I'm getting higher in age, right? And my skin's a little saggier. It, can't it clip my skin as the disc is going? I'm losing business for these people. I'm sorry. Let me shut up. No, it's no, you're totally fine. I, I like feedback. I know this option exists, but you know what? There's a lot of options that exist in the world that are like really nice in theory, but there's problems with them, you know? And that's something you know, that like you're worried about getting pinched by it, huh? Yeah, because like, my whole butt that. is not going to fit on that disc. So part of my skin, it might be, you know, sag and get clipped as it it's the end of that track. I would throw a chucks pad over it. That's what. That's how I would use it. Uh, uh, <laughs> Just so, because I wouldn't want that. I feel like I would get pinched. I feel like it, like yeah. you could definitely get pinched here. But I would throw a chucks pad over it, and that way you're not getting pinched and you're just sliding on the disc. Okay. 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 Cool. And I'm gonna be honest with you. I know these exist. I know some people like them. Do I have a ton of hands-on experience with this particular item? I do not. I know it exists, and some people like them. That's Are there other sliding boards that you like? Um, this is the only one that I know that's designed to, to minimize friction. Got you. Um, there's also some that are just like, if you, you can Google it too. Like there's some that are like, you know, they're kind of wood or whatever, but then there's some that are, that are lower friction surfaces. Um, they're like more of a plasticky surface. And I think that has less friction also like 
it's kind of like how you're doing it too. Like there's like, if you put on bike shorts or something like that and slide across a sliding board, yeah. there's going to be way less friction. You, you know what I mean? Cause it's slippery. It's like that nylon versus the, the hard surface. Yeah. Um, so I don't think you necessarily need one of these to reduce the friction. This is just an option. You just want to think about it. Like how can I reduce friction when I'm sliding? For some people, it's not wearing any pants at all and just plopping their butt on the, on the chucks pad, putting the plastic side down where that plastic slides right across that wooden surface, you know, yeah. uh, for other people, they, they sell like bike shorts um, that were specially made for this that have like, um, like a, they're like very, very slippery, but you could regular bike shorts are fine too. Like, you know, those elastic ones are not elastic yeah. ones, but they're like stretchy. Um, yeah, they're yeah. just very slippery. So they slide well across surfaces. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And before I forget, I want to talk about those beds for <laughs> I want to talk about the beds for a second too, like those low, low air loss mattresses. Um, that's actually next on my list, but there's, there's ways you can make those more effective too. So that has to do with friction. Um, pressure reducing support surfaces. We already talked about cushions. We already talked about these beds. Um, people, almost everybody, in my opinion, with, with a spinal cord injury benefits from a higher level cushion on a wheelchair, some kind of pressure, not just your standard wheelchair cushion, like something that's custom to your body or has a higher level of, of air flotation to it, like a Rojo. Um, and they're all different. They have different kinds, different shapes, different sizes. And that's where a seating clinic or a wheelchair clinic can help. Um, this is, you know, these are examples of some Rojos. This is an example of a low air loss mattress. One thing I will say that I didn't mention when we talked about low air loss mattresses before is they work best with almost nothing under them. And so, what will happen, and this happens in hospitals a lot too, is they'll order you the nice, fancy, low air loss mattress, and then they'll put a, like a, a fitted sheet and a, and a real thick blanket, and they'll put all this stuff underneath you on it, and then they'll put you on top of it. And what they're doing is kind of like negating the whole low air loss feature. And so, and this is something you can advocate for is if you're ever in a situation where you're on a low air loss mattress, and they've got like a thick folded blanket under you as a draw sheet, and they've got like, you know, a fitted sheet and all this other stuff, you can tell them, hey, you know, I've, I've learned that low air loss mattresses actually function a lot better with minimal stuff under them. We recommend, and it's hard for people to get used to this, but we recommend for the, the maximum like wound healing, skin protection that you can get is the only thing you put under somebody is like one thin draw sheet if you need it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if somebody needs that, you may not need a draw sheet, but you don't talk about the sheet they pull people around in the hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I use yeah, you did. yeah, I don't know if you guys use them or not. You probably don't, but um, if they are using that on you, um, don't let them put some big, heavy blanket underneath you as a draw sheet. Cause it's going to take away that low air loss. Feature. Oh, they'll put like two chucks. I know it. a put everything. On top. It's a yeah. Lot. And so you're absolutely, you might as well not even got the air bed. <laughs> so yeah. it's okay. frustrating. So that's the thing. Yeah. They'll be like a thick blanket. They're not even using a sheet, a draw sheet. They're using like a draw blanket. And then they'll put like two yeah. chucks pads and then a fitted sheet. And so you have all these layers and all that does is trap heat and moisture next to the body. And it totally gets rid of that, that low air loss feature. And so, and that's, what's protecting your skin. So what we recommend is like take off the draw sheet or the draw blanket, you know, the stick draw blanket, don't use that. Um, if they want to put a single chucks pad under somebody, okay. But put it just on top of a thin, thin, thin draw sheet. So a thin draw sheet, a single chucks pad and nothing else. Um, really the less the less you have under your body period is better in terms of like reducing that moisture from from kind of weakening the skin but especially on lower loss mattresses it's important um yeah here my next slide advocate for yourself people do not understand skin skin protection they really don't and, and i feel like this is maybe my own my own life experiences but i take care of so many patients with wounds that got those wounds in the hospital and i was a wound nurse in a hospital for a long time and so you know, without going into why these things, you know, there's staffing issues. Or, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why these things occur. But long story short, I feel like one of the most dangerous places for people in terms of having their skin break down, especially if they have SCI, is going to be in the hospital. Um, because it's just, you're, you're in the hospital because you're sick. There's some, you're not 100%. So you're already at higher risk. You're not doing well. Something's going on. Um, but then the thing is, you, you may not have, the, you know, people may not be turning you people may not be helping you reposition as frequently as they should or at all. Um, yeah. they, they may not be putting you on a support surface that's appropriate for you. They may just plunk you on some regular old hospital bed that has no pressure redistribution features. Um, oh God, you're in the ER 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was I was injured for I think maybe seven years, and I was totally just irresponsible, just because I didn't know, and I just was wanted to be out all the time and doing things, and I never got a sore until I got a super bad urine infection. Again, I was being irresponsible, and I went septic, and so I was violent and like just wild at the at the ER and in the hospital. So they like. From what, from what I was, from my understanding and what I remember, I was kind of cuffed to the bed, wow. like res- restrained. And yeah. I stayed on my back for three days. Oh, and God. that was when I got this, this sacral wound. And I lost yeah. like all the hair on the back of my head. Cause I was like flailing all the time. And like, thank oh. God it wasn't like a bad sore back there in that separate area. Um, I did lose my hair though, but um, yeah. So the only wound that I ever got was from the hospital. So it's very what you're saying that is the story that I hear so many someone goes into the hospital because they have a a bad UTI and they come out with like sometimes a really serious pressure injury yeah and And then they send uh, them to double cute to a nursing home oh god oh my god yeah Yeah. and it's it's really it doesn't have to be like that and it's really tough because you know, people don't prioritize skin health in the hospital. They're so worried about everything else. Oh, we got to take blood. We've got to do this. We got to do that. Yeah. We don't have enough people. You know, there, there's always reasons and excuses. Um, and for me, because all, all I've ever done is wound care stuff. And, and so a big part of my job when I worked in the hospital was like trying to figure out how to help them not have pressure injuries. And so I can talk about this. I can, I don't, I, I can talk about this a lot because it drives me nuts. <laughs> but um I ultimately think you would just have to, you have to, you have to advocate for yourself or have somebody advocate for you. You can absolutely not trust um, any hospital system yeah. to put you on a support surface and, and, and think that's appropriate for you and think about the fact that you are an individual who's at very high risk for pressure injury and you need extra, extra consideration. And that sucks. I wish it wasn't like that, but uh, you just got to have, you got to have, and, it's, and how do you advocate for yourself when you have, you know, so when you're septic, right? Right. you're not you're not here you're, you're sick you know so it's it's tough um i guess the main thing that i think is is as soon as you the er is where they often happen because the yeah. er has this excuse my language the crappiest beds in the whole hospital they usually don't even have beds they have like these stretcher things you know what i mean yeah. um so and those are horrible for the skin so often those pressure injuries start when somebody's in the er for three hours you know being tied to a bed it's not even a bed it's like a padded stretcher and that's where they start. And so the, the damage was already done in the ER. And yeah. then you discharge to the rest of the hospital and, you know, kind of develops over the course, but often they start in ER. So my advice is always like, it's, it's as the second you get there, if you have somebody with you who can remember this, or if you're able to, if you're able to speak for yourself and you're not so sick that you can't, is start demanding an air bed. Like as soon as you get there, I need an air. Bed. I've gotten pressure ulcers before in hospitals. I got a pressure ulcer last time I was in the hospital. And so in, if they if you say that enough, it starts to, to get their attention because I'll tell you what, if a patient gets a hospital acquired pressure injury, um, they get in trouble for it. The hospital gets in trouble. They don't get paid the full amount from insurance. Mm-hmm. And so not everybody, I mean, that's a weird way. That's a horrible way of thinking about it, but they will pay attention if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you, if you talk about it enough. And I just demand an air bed. You know, I have to have an air bed. I need an air mattress. I need a low air loss mattress if I'm in the hospital. Every time I go to the hospital, I get a pressure injury. Um, and they have them. They sometimes they them, sometimes they have them. ways to get. I'm like, this hospital is not that big. I know. And it's like days later, great. You know, fantastic. The damage has already been done, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's all I, you know, just just demand that. And some people I I knew one patient who was um he was paraplegic. He came in the hospital for urinary tract stuff, um, and he would—he <laughs> knew the drill. He was like, "Yeah, they never could take some days to get me an air bed." And he would take his rojo and he would just stick it under his butt in the hospital bed as soon as he got there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and it helped. You know, and, and I hate that people have to do that, but you really in hospitals are a dangerous place for skin. Um, so I say, just advocate, advocate, advocate as much as you can for getting an air bed. Talk to the manager. You know, talk to whoever. <laughs> <laughs> do whatever you can to get it um say loudly know. like i don't want to have to sue another hospital man oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that'll get it done <laughs> <laughs> i like that that is awesome yes yeah, so you're on the phone with your lawyer 
<laughs> do whatever you can to get that air better because it's going to help you and and push that call get them to turn you know if you're having trouble because you're not feeling well and you can't really reposition yourself and you're you know you see your, you're looking down there and you see your heels sit on the mattress and nobody's doing anything about it like put keep on them you know they are there to, to take care of you and and they they never prioritize skin that's okay you can hit that call light and get it again until they do um so i just I, I think people really have to advocate for themselves for skin health in hospitals for sure I I just want to add these days it's difficult to even get a pillow like I know it's difficult to even get a pillow it's tough um so it's I just go to the hospital like when I know like I go like I'm camping I I'm bringing my pillow I'm bringing my pillowcases I'm bringing my own yeah. I'm bringing my own soap I'm bringing my own lotion I'm bringing my because they also don't moisturize I think moisturization is a huge issue Absolutely. That's actually on my, my second to last slide. Yes, it okay. is. It's, then I'll let you go on, girl. No, no, I, I'm glad you know that. That's awesome. But um, yeah, no, you should bring out everything you can because the thing is, you're right. Like, unfortunately, the resources that they give are not enough to protect people's skin a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so so bladder and bowel management, super important. Um, the reason why it's important for skin health is if you can, if you can, you know, follow your catheterization schedule. And, you know, you may not be doing intermittent catheters. You might have a super pubic catheter. Whatever you're doing to manage your bladder, try to keep it on point where you're not having a lot of leaks. Um, if you're experiencing a lot of bladder leakage between catheterizations, or if you have a super pubic catheter or an endwelling Foley catheter around the catheter, talk to your urologist because sometimes there's medications that can help reduce that leakage. Not for everybody, you know, you need to talk to your urologist, but if you're having a lot of bladder leakage and you're doing everything they told you to do with the catheters, let the, give them that feedback because there's other options. Sometimes there's some treatments and some, um, some medications that they can do that will reduce those bladder spasms and reduce the frequency of leaks. So just, you know, you may have some sometimes, but if it's a lot, just it might be worth talking to somebody about because there's sometimes stuff they don't do right away, but they can do to help reduce that. Um, bowel, bowel program, same thing. If you have a bowel program that's working well for you and, and you're not having a lot of abstinence, great. Uh, or any, you know, fantastic. Or if you have a, a colostomy, um, a lot of folks get a colostomy because they prefer that. That's totally fine too. Um, just make sure that your skin isn't being exposed a lot to moisture. And if it is, you know, that that's a big risk factor. And so there's options. You know, if, you're, if your bowel program isn't working well, talk to your, your medical person about it. Maybe there's something they can look into. Um, a diverting colostomy is also an option. If your bowel program cannot be optimized, if you've tried everything and you're still having issues with it, again, a colostomy, it can sound like, you know, it can sound like this big deal. It is a big deal. Everything's a big deal. It can sound like something that's like, oh my gosh, I would never want that. But I will tell you that I have a lot of patients who went that route and they're, they're, they're happier with it because it's easier for them to deal with. So just an option. And it's well, also reversing that I know everyone that I know that it's done it. Most everyone that I've spoken to has been happier with it. It's, it can be, it's, it, I mean, if your bowel program works great, then it's great. You know, you don't even need to go that route. But if your bowel program is just taking a lot of time or not highly effective, a colostomy can make a real difference in terms of just giving you control again. And they're reversible um, usually, right? Yep. Totally reversible. Um, they just, it's actually pretty, it's a pretty, it sounds like a big procedure, but it's not, it's a surgery. It's a surgery, but they don't like, they usually do it laparoscopically they pull a little piece of the intestine and they form a little stoma. It looks like a little hole on your abdomen. It kind of looks like a little rose butt. It's like a little protruding, looks like red nipple or something. <laughs> um, they look kind of swollen after surgery, but then they shrink down and the stool will just come out of there and you wear like a little discreet pouch and you just empty it or throw away the pouch as needed. Um, and a lot of times it's not, it, it completely eliminates the possibility of, ha of having um, like fecal incontinence. So that, that's the benefit to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's and it's easy. To, it's in the front, so you can take care of it easier. Sometimes people with like less arm function struggle with the bowel program, um, or they just don't want somebody to help them with it. And a colostomy is like an option there too. I thought that those were able to be like not plugged essentially, but that maybe just covered. And then when you want it to like have a bowel movement, you can put the bag on and then remove it. But from what I've learned, you kind of always have to have the bag there, right? You. <laughs> That's the, so here's the thing with a colostomy, um, you don't, if, if you're just having a colostomy with a stoma and I don't know, do you guys know what it looks like? I mean, I can show you. I like pictures. Um, so like a stoma, let's see. Oh no. Um, 
so it just kind of looks like yeah there you go yeah it looks like this you know it's it, this is a stoma this looks like a real person with one um this this person has a big scar but a lot of times they're doing them laparoscopically now so that you you wouldn't have any scar you would just have this guy and so it heals up and it looks like this and then you wear the pouch around it but you don't have there's no sphincter muscle there so you don't have control so basically like when you have your bowel movement it, you're gonna have it and it goes into the bag and then you empty the bag but they have also closed pouches um then these are a lot of um people with spinal cord injury that have colostomies like these um so what they'll have is like a, a closed pouch so you don't ever have to empty it and so what you'll do is like you'll have let's say a lot of times people kind of have a, a routine like they're like wow i always have my bowel movement after my morning coffee or whatever you know and so they'll kind of identify when that is they'll go into their bag they'll just take it off throw it away and pop on a clean one and they're done um and so that's you don't really have the ability to be like oh now it's happening it's just like it's going to happen when it happens but there is a thing called colostomy irrigation that is like not very common in the united states but they definitely do it in europe more where you give yourself an enema through the stoma you use like a, um, and you can do this. Um, I'm trying to think like if there's a picture, basically like this. So you have like this enema bag with a tube and a little cone on the tip of the, of the tube and the water flows through it. <laughs> every morning or every other morning, kind of like a bowel program really, you put the, the cone into the stoma, you run the water in there and then everything in there comes out. So it flushes out all the fecal material. And then you won't have a bowel movement for like 24 to 48 hours. And those, if you do it routinely, like every other day, you do your, your colostomy irrigation or your bowel flush, you won't have to wear a bag. You can just wear a little patch over the stoma instead. Mm. Um, and there's lots of resources online about that. There's a, if you're interested in learning more about colostomies, um, the United Ostomy Association of America, and I can send their, their website in the chat. They have like so many resources about all this stuff. So yeah. much. Uh, I'll put it in the chat. They have really great advice. They have like a community. They have conferences. They have like a cool blog. Like they just, they just have everything. And they have a lot of materials about colostomy irrigation because a lot of times doctors don't, they don't know that much about it because it's not as widely done here, but it's something, it's only for colostomies. So there's different kinds of stomas. It's gotta be for colostomy for, for, to, for it to work. Um, but yeah, it's something you can do every other day, flush it out, wear a little patch instead. Hmm. Okay. Um, but yeah, so in terms, um, terms of like healing and hydration, um, and th oops, sorry, and things like that, um, like we started this whole conversation with like food, food is really important, um, in terms of wound prevention, as well as healing, we want to eat a healthy diet as much as possible, you know, and that doesn't mean you can't like treat yourself sometimes. It just means you want to think, okay, so I'm getting enough protein in my diet. I'm getting, um, enough vitamins in my diet. So diet's always the first. We can take supplements too, but I always say try diet first. Eat eat vegetables and fruits. Fruits and vegetables, beans, whole grains, you know, lean protein, stuff like that is good for your skin. Um, try not to lose too much weight. Sometimes when people get sick, they lose a lot of weight. Um, if you lose a lot of weight and you're real bony, it's going to be hard. There's not there's less padding on on those um, those areas that are putting pressure. Now some people are naturally thinner and that's fine. But a lot of weight loss real fast could definitely make those bones protrude more. Um, so, you know, you just want to maintain a healthy body weight. Um, vitamin C and zinc are important for wound healing. So if you have a wound, make sure that's, you know, you're getting enough of that. And fluid intake, hydration, you know, skin that's, we hydrate from the inside out. And lotions are great too, but we want to definitely hydrate. So stay hydrated. Um, make sure that, you know, that's, that's good for all kinds of things. Um, so for strong skin, here's some other advice. You know, if you smoke cigarettes, try to quit or smoke a little bit less. Your doctor can help. Cigarettes reduce the circulation to your skin. And so that can also cause issues um, with that skin tolerance. Soft, non-restrictive clothing. You know, you don't want stiff clothes underneath you, that kind of thing. Um, shoes. Um, they recommend wearing, you know, if your shoe size before you were injured was a size nine, you might want to be needing to wear like a 10 or larger, you know, you need to have a shoe that's big enough to like not squeeze or, or, your, or your foot or put pressure on your foot because you may not be able to feel it. So we recommend that you wear shoes a bit larger than your, than your regular size. 
um, range of motion exercises. And, and those don't have to be necessarily planned like this whole routine. Just make sure that you know, you're putting on shoes and you're getting out of bed and you're doing things that put your limbs in different positions. or doing some stretches and doing some range of motion exercises because that's how you reduce the severity of contractures. If you're never moving your legs from one position, eventually they're going to get contractured and sort of stay in that position. And sometimes that position means that you're putting a lot of pressure on certain areas when you're like in bed, for example. So you just want to have loose and fairly flexible limbs. It's better than having contractures. Keeping the skin clean and dry. Use gentle soaps. Don't scrub your skin. And moisturizers, like you said, moisturized skin is happy skin. So we want to use moisturizers and, and gentle soaps and keep that, that protective layer on the skin there because it helps. Um, treating a pressure injury, I'm not going to go so much into that because it's so individualized. You know, um, there's just so much, it depends on the wound, on where it's at, you know, there's just a million ways to heal a wound. But the most important thing that you can do is to relieve the pressure immediately. If you have a pressure injury, get off of it. Get off of it and stay off of it while it heals as much as you can. Um, rotate positions though, so you don't develop another pressure injury somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Eat a balanced diet with a lot of protein. You got to have protein in order to heal. Consider a supplement, you know, consider a supplement while you're trying to heal a wound. A protein supplement that's specifically for wound healing is usually best. Um, um, get pressure to reduce. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, one, how important of a role does collagen specifically play in uh, something like this? And is there, are there actual viable ways to get collagen? Like my mother would have me chew on chicken bones all day if she could, because of the marrow, right? Yeah. You know, is, is, is collagen, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some, there's some, there's some research and evidence that like dietary collagen can improve your skin, right? Um, I think that it probably wouldn't hurt. Like if you're trying to heal a wound, to, to include collagen in your diet. I don't think it's going to hurt anything. I don't know how crucial it is in terms of healing pressure injuries. Cause I just don't, I haven't read the, the research or the evidence that says that absolutely collagen is going to heal this wound. You know what I mean? But I think it certainly doesn't hurt. And I'll tell you where collagen is really useful. <laughs> so collagen dressings are, are very useful. Um, yeah. And again, I, I don't, I'm, I don't want to give you, I can't really give you guys medical advice on here, but I know that we use, I use in my practice with my patients, I use collagen dressings a lot um, with debridement uh, for, for pressure injuries that are not healing well. And so the, the way collagen dressings work, um, it's kind of magical, honestly, is so, you know, collagen has all these like, these collagen dressings are kind of like mimicking your body's own tissues. Um, and because it has collagen, just like your body has collagen in it these dressings have collagen in it. And sometimes they have other stuff that they put in there too. Um, but, but what happens is, is you debride a wound. Like, so let's let somebody has had a pressure injury for like three months. They're not getting anywhere. So they're doing everything right. It's just hanging out. It's not healing. You debride it. Even if there's no necrotic tissue in it, you cut them. You take something sharp and you cut the surface of that wound until they bleed. And it reminds their body there's a wound there. Oh, wow. Because your body will forget. If a wound's been there for a long time, and it hasn't healed, your body just forgets it's there. It's like, oh, we're not healing anymore. No problem. So when you cut them, you sort of wake them up. Like, hey, there's a wound here. <laughs> you got to heal. And if you put a collagen dressing in that wound, that collagen is like a trap. All the inflammatory bad stuff that gets in chronic wounds that prevents them from healing, instead of bothering the body's own collagen, instead of bother bothering like the body's own tissues, it breaks down that dressing instead. Oh, okay. And so that's why collagen's magic in wound care. Um, you know, it just, it just, it's just nice. <laughs> it, I'm not saying it's like a cure-all. You still got to do all the other things. But when we talk about collagen dressings, that's how they work. Um, they work really well with debridement. In my, and that's just my opinion. You know, um, you know, you debride the wound, you wake it up, you put a collagen dressing in there. All those bad inflammatory things go for the collagen and the dressing instead of the patient. And then the patient's able to heal a little bit faster. Um, so they, they're, they're a good product. So we do use collagen in wound care topically. Now, in terms of eating more collagen for your skin, I think it can't hurt. A lot of people seem to think it helps. I don't know of anything that says it's like fantastic for, for healing pressure injuries, but again, I don't, I don't think it would hurt for sure. Um, 
But yeah, so pressure reducing support surfaces, if you have a wound, it's the time to get them. And they can really help uh, give you more time to sit on your butt or to sit on your back and, and not, you know, to redistribute that pressure. Um, and then seek a medical professional for wound treatment. Like if you, if you have just a little, like, you know, stage one situation um, or something that you've had before that's real minor and you know just what to do and it's no problem. But if you have a pressure injury, it's not getting better. You know, it's been there for, for it's been there for a few weeks and you don't, you're not seeing any improvement. Um, and it's open. You know, try to see a medical professional who has a wound background, um, if possible, because they may be able to order you some of these these dressings that I'm talking about, like these 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 uh, advanced wound products that can really make that perfect wound environment to help heal. What we say with with wounds is like, you know, generally speaking, you we moist wounds heal better, so we want dressings that don't keep it saturated. We don't want it soaking wet because that's bad for it but we don't want it bone dry either. We want a wound to stay moist and protected and like everything perfect underneath that dressing because that's really what facilitates the healing. And, and you know, a wound person can, can take a look and make, make um, recommendations about products and things like that. And here's some additional resources for you guys. Um, the Consortium for Spinal Cord Medicine has a really cool guidebook. I'll show it to you if you want. Um, they have a guidebook, it's like in depth. But it's kind of cool. I like to, I learned a lot from it. Um, but you can print it out or look at it in PDF. It just has like everything I talked about, but other stuff too. Just all kinds of stuff about um, preventing and treating pressure injuries for people with spinal cord injury. And it's from the, the spinal cord injury experts. So I've included that. Um, I like these videos because I'm a video person. Like for me to learn a thing, I, I don't, I don't know. I like to read, but like if it's like a, actually like how to do a thing, I like to see. Why not let me open that? Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, this, well, this link here it takes you to a, a website where they have a videos demonstrating pressure relief maneuvers for like all types of wheelchairs with a real person in a real wheelchair showing you how to do it, mm -hmm. and then. This is another video that I included that has a lot of the skin stuff that we talked about, like all the different positions and different things that you can do to um, maintain skin health. So I just included those. And that's really all I have. Do you guys have any, any questions? So I can answer questions about anything with skin or if you want to learn more about wound products, anything you want. Um, let me check the chat. No. Um, no, don't have any questions there. No. Okay. Well, I'm glad I got to meet all of you. I hope I hope some of this was. I feel like you guys are a knowledgeable bunch, but <laughs> I hope it, some of it was useful. And if you ever have any questions um, about anything, I'm, I'm always you can always email me. I can put my email in the chat. I, I never mind. I love talking about wound stuff and, and helping people find resources. I will make sure then to put include your email in the follow up email, and I'll and I'll include the slides. Cool. Do you have my email? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Well, awesome. Yeah, just um, email me if you have any questions and, and let me know if you ever want me to talk about ostomy stuff. I do. Um, if that's ever an interest, um, I can absolutely do a presentation on that. Just let me know. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll be doing that at some point in the future. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Just but let me know. Thank you so much. This was great and in depth. And and trust me, all of us aren't knowledgeable. And a lot of the people who will probably have newer injuries aren't aren't able to be here today. So the recording is going to be a blessing. Oh, cool. Well, I'm glad I could help. I love. I'm I'm glad somebody wants to hear about all this. <laughs> I'm glad you're passionate about it. I love it. <laughs> I like preventing wounds. That's my jam. Like, I mean, I like wound. I like healing wounds, but I would way rather just not have them to begin with. Yes. <laughs> Yes, you and me both. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. Absolutely. You, it was great to meet all of you. And um, I'm sure we'll, we'll be uh, seeing each other again soon. All right. Sounds good. All right. Take care. You. you guys have a great rest of your week. You too.